my name is Kelsey Herber, and welcome to The Restoration Road with my dad, Mitch Cruz. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the value of vulnerability. I was so excited that you were given a message at the Huntington University Chapel. And uh, I get there, and I'm like on the edge of my seat during worship, wanting to know how this is all gonna go. And mm -hmm. you get up and you give this talk. And I just thought it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And people need to hear it. I needed to hear it. So I'm really eager for you to walk mm -hmm. us through uh, vulnerability and the value of vulnerability. Um, well, I'm, I'm excited too, and I was thankful to Huntington University for giving me the opportunity to share this. And to be honest, it's a message that I needed to hear myself. Um, so God was definitely working in me through it as well. You know, if someone came up to us and said, what was your greatest accomplishment in life? I think almost everyone gets excited to share that information. Yep. Well, I got a story for you. Mm -hmm. Because we feel good about that. I'd say my four daughters. Oh, well, thank you. I don't know if that's an accomplishment, but. That's very kind. Um, however, if somebody were to flip that and say, that's great. Now tell me, what was your biggest mistake? <laughs> exactly. That is a lot harder. Mm -hmm. I think about um, being a little girl. And I went through this phase where I wanted to confess my sins to you and mom. Yes, you did. But. Saying that to your face is very difficult. Vulnerability is hard. Therefore, I would write them on a little piece of paper. I, you know this. And I would slide them under the door. That way you guys could read them and I wouldn't have to be around. The door of our bedroom. Yes, the door so of our bedroom. So you'd hear, shh, <laughs> Kelsey confessing again. <laughs> and the confessions were sort of like, I'm really not sure if this happened, but because I'm not sure, I want to say. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I just think even way back then, I may have not realized it, but vulnerability was hard. That would be a great devotional, the bedroom confessional. <laughs> That's what that was. That mm -hmm. was like a confessional and you would go, shh. Mm -hmm. What was <laughs> <laughs> What was funny is when I when I did share this mes message in the Huntington University Chapel afterwards, one of my players came running up to me and said, Kelsey, did I ever tell you that I, I did that as a little girl? Are you kidding me? Supposedly during my talk, her best friend looked at her and said, like, did you tell her? Did you tell her that you used to do that? And so I, I'm not the only one. That makes me feel a lot better. That makes a me feel a lot better too. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I think of other examples in life of how I've seen vulnerability be difficult. Um, when I was in sixth grade, uh, Mr. Anderson was our teacher and he had something called bug day. And what you did is you were able to either submit a joke um, or any type of question. And what you could do is you would write it on a piece of paper, you'd fold it up and we'd put it in this bucket. And Mr. Anderson would draw one by one and go through all of them, but you wouldn't know who wrote them. So again, Vulnerability is hard. He gave a message one time at church that uh, really spoke to me. And he got up and said, when it comes to Jesus, I'm a fan. Is that pretty good? It was really good. And an addict. So I am a fan addict. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Amazing guy. He really, he really was. Um, and so I'm thankful that I got to experience those bug days with him. Uh, I even think about sleepovers. Now, I don't know how much you would know about, about a slumber party. Not much. <laughs> Bob Sutton used to have me over. <laughs> well, there you go. What I realized when I think back to sleepovers I even had as a little girl, some of our deepest conversations happen at night when we're all laying in our sleeping bags, lights are off, you're just talking basically to no one, but you know that your friends are laying next to you. So that's how that works. Exactly. And, and I don't think it's a coincidence why those conversations took place then versus in the daylight when I'm looking right at your face. There's something easier about saying it in the dark and not having to look somebody in the eye. Do, 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 do. <laughs> You're not going to let me live that one down. It's just awesome. Well, then... <laughs> Kelsey can trust it again. <laughs> well, then I found a personal example of vulnerability being difficult. As I was looking through, I was on my uh, laptop one day and I clicked on iMessages. And all these iMessages popped up from years ago. So I start reading through some of them. And I landed on this. And what this is, <laughs> is a poem. Okay. That I wrote to Zach, who is now my husband, but at the time had been my boyfriend for 18 days. 
18 days as your boyfriend and you send him a poem via text? And I sent him a poem via text because I guarantee you, I would have never said this to his face 18 days in. So you're still, do, 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 do. <laughs> you're still doing it. Yes. Okay. Basically. All right. But because we're talking about vulnerability, it's really not fair if I'm not vulnerable in this process. So I'm going to read this poem that I wrote to my boyfriend of 18 days, who is now my husband. So I want to point out that this somehow worked in my favor. Roses are red. You did not. <laughs> I started with roses are red. It's a classic. Let me guess the next line. <laughs> Violets are blue. Yes. My boyfriend is the best. I know this is true. I don't know why God gave him to me. No matter what, he is as sweet as can be. You can search high, you can search low, but look into his big blue eyes and you'll think, whoa. <laughs> you really <laughs> This did. is good stuff, right? One text? It didn't this break it up? This is all one text. Okay. He wrote me the absolute sweetest letter. I could never ask for anything better. His favorite color is blue. Pizza is his favorite food. Whenever I'm with him, he puts me in such a good mood. He bought me the most beautiful welcome home flowers. I could talk to him on the phone for hours and hours. As cheesy as this poem may be, <laughs> yes, it's just a little something to show you how much you mean to me. I've never been so happy in my entire life. I know you'll be there for me no matter the strife. Thank you for simply being who you are. It has been an amazing 18 days so far. <laughs> and right when you think I'm done, I'm not. Oh, okay. We got a whole paragraph left. I want you to feel like you can tell me anything at all. Whenever you need me, just give me a call. Bottom line, whatever you do, you're always making me grow in my feelings for you. I hope your day is filled with lots of joy. You are definitely my favorite boy. <laughs> now remember, oh, oh, remember, oh, oh. remember. I was just thinking what rhymed. You were a man. Yes, and it rhymed, so it's okay. It's all right. Remember to smile this whole day through and never forget how much I really, really, really like you. Love, Kelsey. You had to put like at the end and then love, Kelsey? Yes. 18 days in. 18 days in. 18 days in, you weren't going to read it to him face to face. Nope. You were going to go... <laughs> yeah, which is exactly what I did. Texting allows you to do that. Yes. Um, so again, another example of why vulnerability is hard. We can see that that's difficult for people. So a lot of times it does end up being hiding behind a telephone screen. That is hilarious and true. So there we have it. Vulnerability is hard. Um, but I want to talk about why vulnerability is hard. And I believe that there are three R's, three R words. Maybe I can remember them. And then maybe you can remember them. Three R words of why vulnerability is tough. The first one is reality. 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 When reality. we verbalize something that's hard for us to share and it's vulnerable, um, Saying it out loud brings that to reality. It makes it real. That is really true. Um, I'm a lot like you because I'm a recovering perfectionist. And I feel like when you say something, it does make it real. Mm -hmm. And that is hard. Yeah. Like if it's negative. Right. So vulnerable, I assume it's, you know, something that's going to not be the greatest thing in the mm -hmm. world that you're going to share. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, puts a period or an exclamation point at the end. Um, I just spoke this out loud and it's yeah. true and it's real. Yeah, all of a sudden it becomes real when we say it out loud. And that a lot of times is really hard for somebody to accept. Yeah. And for some reason, even just thinking it doesn't feel real until it literally comes out of our mouth. As a promoter, marketing kind of business guy, mm -hmm. that mine was with the auction business, that Obviously, you accentuate the positive in everything you do. Yeah. Um, but, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, when there's a negative yeah. and it's about you, that's tough. Absolutely. So, the first R is reality. The second R is reputation. Being vulnerable, saying something out loud to somebody else that's difficult for us to share. All of a sudden, we are concerned about what do they think of me now? Yeah, and who are they going to tell and what are they going to think? And then who are they going to tell? What are they going to think? And how's it going to get stored along the way? Exactly. And at the end of the day, how does that all affect 
my reputation at the mm -hmm. end of the day. My big reputation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the third R is rejection. When we are vulnerable with somebody else, there's this fear of rejection. They could hear what we have to share, and at that point they could say, I'm sorry, that's too much for me. Yep. I'm sorry, I can't accept that about you. Yep. And I think at the end of the day, that fear keeps a lot of us away from being vulnerable with others. Those are really good observations. Reality, mm -hmm. reputation, yep. rejection. Yes, you got it. Um, because my reputation is real. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to be pretty vulnerable here. No, um, no, 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 so no. So this is part of the In deal. the words of my grandfather, I don't mind if you want to confess your sins, <laughs> but don't confess mine. But, but here's my question for you. Which R word do you feel like is most difficult for you when it comes to being vulnerable? Easy. Which one? Reality. I can handle the rejection thing. I don't know, might have been growing up that it's either right or it's wrong, it's black or it's white, it's, mm -hmm. you know, clean, neat, tidy categories. I always thought, kind of got, probably caught it at church that rejection's kind of a badge of honor if that happens for a good stand. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I've never really uh, struggled with that very much. Reputation, again, I don't know, it's, um, you can't control a lot of that. Mm -hmm. You can control your input to that, but you can't control uh, the outcome of a lot of that. If somebody's yeah. got something against you and it's wrong and it's based on a wrong mm -hmm. foundation, or uh, there's not much you can do about it. You can't really control what other people do. Mm -hmm. But reality, there's something about when you speak something out loud mm -hmm. for somebody else to hear that it's now become real. Yeah. So that that's... Uh, that's a tough one for me, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I look at these three R words and I think back um, to a time in my life where all three were very prevalent. When I was diagnosed with anorexia my freshman year of high school, I think all three of these R words played a role in why it was very hard for me to share what I was going through with other people. Um, I became very closed off. I wouldn't even tell my best friends what was going on. Eventually, my best friend had to approach me about it, um, which I'm so thankful for because I don't know if I would have ever taken that step. And even with my within my own family, you know, everybody, you know, mom, you and my sisters all know what's going on, but at the same time was still very difficult for me to talk about. And I tried to avoid that. And I think with reality, I myself didn't want to say it out loud because I knew then it would become real. I remember finding out that I had been diagnosed with anorexia and I would not refer to it as anorexia for the longest time. It, I eventually got to a point where I'd maybe say eating disorder, but there's something about the term anorexia that I just could not get myself to verbalize out loud because I knew in that moment, the moment I said it, it would become real to me. And a negative label maybe to you? Yeah, absolutely. And then that would go into the second R word, reputation. I was so fearful of what people would think. Are they gonna define me by this? Are they th gonna think I'm crazy? Um, and that was so scary to me that I just decided, well, I just won't tell anybody. That way there is no, um, there is no possibility of it affecting my reputation in a negative way. And then I think about rejection. And I think that was probably at the root of all of it was if I share this with somebody close to me that I love, that I even trust, and for some reason, that's not something they feel like they can be a part of, that they can't go through that experience with me and walk alongside me, that that would be the greatest pain that I could encounter in that moment. This all started off with you trying to eat healthy. So you were trying mm -hmm. to hit the right mark. Yeah. And it happened so fast. I would say like in a period of 30 days, you had restricted enough that your body couldn't cover from it for yeah. probably another 18 months. Yeah. And I mean, we're with you all the time. We saw what you ate. So I remember you and I having a conversation and I actually put the extra calories out on the counter mm -hmm. of what that would be to consume. And we, yeah. we talked through it and stuff. And I, I thought from the beginning, because uh, we were with you, we knew you, um, we knew there wasn't some other kind of uh, an outside uh, trauma mm -hmm. that 
it, it seemed that it was all a perfectionism thing, all yeah. you looking toward, the, I'm gonna make everything perfect and right and neat and mm-hmm. tidy, yep. and you, you miss the mark. Yep. And um, so I felt like that what was, is what was going on in your heart. Mm-hmm. This ended up being probably the most difficult thing that we had ever gone through as a family because you can't control it to a positive end quickly. You can't right. microwave success here. It's a step at a time, and yep. it's a long journey. It is. Um, so I think all three of those things, as a parent, um, are taking place too. So you mm-hmm. could say, my daughter has anorexia. You know, am I, I going to say that? Yeah. Um, because it is it reflecting poorly on me as mm-hmm. a parent. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what I think the irony of it all is? And you can give your expert opinion on this. Yeah from all your uh, counseling uh, studies. The irony is everybody knew by looking at you what the situation was. Mm -hmm. You were not who you were before. Mm -hmm. And I was even approached by another adult female that said, I know Kelsey has anorexia and I just wanna let you know I'll do anything I can to help. And that was really early on. That's before you would ever have said you had it, yeah. or even an eating disorder. And um, so the irony is when you're not vulnerable, mm-hmm. people still see um, the circumstance. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And then I want you to tell me more about your best friend approaching you because I didn't I didn't I don't think I understand that or know that. Yeah. So uh, my best friend Annie when you know this eating disorder began there was a period of time where like i said people started to notice like you said they knew without me saying anything yet i would not talk about it you know even with my closest friends um so annie being one of them one day she finally you know took that step even though i'm sure that was scary for her um and she wrote me a letter and so she gave me a letter just kind of saying you know just expressing that she could see that I was struggling Um, to this day, it makes me emotional. Um, And that she loved me and cared for me enough that she was basically inviting herself into that process with me. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Do you have that letter? I'm sure I do. I wish I could say that I had it somewhere special where I know exactly where it is. I'm sure I do. But all your possessions are in a handful of boxes right now. Right, exactly. Um, but like I said, had she not done that, I don't know how long it would have taken me to go to her. So that really was the moment where the door kind of opened mm-hmm. and I thought, okay, she knows and she wants to, she wants to walk alongside me. I might as well let her. And that was life changing for me just to have somebody step into that with me. And that would have been a 14 to 15 year old girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So we talked about, you know, vulnerability is hard. And and here are three R words, three reasons why it's so difficult. Um, But now I think it's important to take a look at what does Scripture say about vulnerability? Um, Because at the end of the day, what Scripture has to say about vulnerability is truly going to be where we need to gain our information about it and our knowledge about it and how to apply it to our lives. So the first passage is Galatians 6, 2. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Short and sweet, but carry each other's burdens. Like Annie did. Exactly. Exactly. I feel like that's what Annie did for me. However, my question is, when I read that passage, how can we carry each other's burdens if we don't know what they are? We need to be able, I think, in applying wisdom to our relationships, like Annie writing the letter. That was, those were the right words at the right time delivered in the right mode. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's where we need to pursue the spirit of God in order to be able to do that, to draw that out. Proverbs 20 verse five says, a person's heart is like deep waters, but a person of understanding can draw them out. Mm -hmm. Understanding is insight. And so the insight into the other person's heart to be able to communicate 
in a wise way to draw out what's in there. She yeah. did that. Mm-hmm. Um, carry each other's burdens, fulfilling the law, literally filling it full. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it means also to clarify the intent of. So when Jesus talked about himself fulfilling the law, he was clarifying the intent of, mm-hmm. he filled it full. Um, and the intent of the law is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and to uh, love others as yourself. Mm-hmm. So this all ties together. Yeah, absolutely. So at the end of the day, you know, not being open about that burden we're carrying can make it difficult for someone to be there for us. You know, thankfully in my situation, I had a best friend who saw past that and, and was able to reach out to me. But if there is a situation where somebody can't physically see what's going on, it may be really difficult for them to be there for you. And so that's when it's really good for us to take that step of vulnerability. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can you truly love without being vulnerable? Truly feeling loved comes from knowing that that person loves all of me. Which goes back to your three R's is why if I'm in that kind of a relationship, I don't want to share um, vul- anything that's vulnerable because mm-hmm. I might be rejected. I might not have the love anymore yeah. that I think I have. Exactly. And so sometimes people think, well, you know, if somebody rejects me and I haven't shared everything with them, mm-hmm. at least they haven't rejected all of me. Mm-hmm. But the moment you're vulnerable and somebody knows the deepest parts of you and then they reject you, again, such a deep hurt. A parallel concept would be in counseling. If you're my counselor and I'm sharing with you something and I know I'm holding quite a bit back, I'm now going to discount the advice you give me because I know you don't know the rest of the yeah. story. Absolutely. First John 1.10 says, If we claim we have not sinned, We make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. When I read that, I thought, whew, that sounds extreme. Um, But at the end of the day, when we're not vulnerable with others, it literally says we don't have his word in us. We are going against his word if we don't do that. The Bible calls us to be vulnerable with one another so we can be in deep relationship with one another. Um, That verse is preceded by if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. So he forgives us, he lets go, and he makes us new again. Um, But the reason I share that is that the word confess means to agree with God. So con together and fess to fess up. You know, I agree with God that this act of my life is apart Mm -hmm. from his design. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's not new to him. Right. But again, that vulnerability brings, is a precursor to bringing that healing in the relationship Mm -hmm. with God. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 6, 11 through 13, it says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. Um, What I find really neat about this passage, we're talking about vulnerability being difficult because oftentimes it's sharing something very difficult um, or something about ourselves that we portray as negative or not something we'd wanna share. But the reality is there is the opposite side of vulnerability and sometimes it's sharing positive affection that can be really hard. Because you might get, Rejected. Rejected, exactly. And sometimes people are afraid of those positive emotions that they have towards somebody else. Yeah. And, and verbalizing them becomes very yeah. difficult. I got to send a poem and a text because I'm not going to say it face-to-face. Exactly, face. exactly. I'm, I'm tracking. Exactly. Um, I think about our family living eulogies oh. that you had us start doing on vacation. Um, so talk a little bit about how you even came up with the idea. Well, uh we were led in our small group by a couple Youth for Christ guys, and they had done this uh, with students before. Mm-hmm. And so they had this idea that we would try it in our small group. Well, I loved it so much. Um, 
not because of hearing something good about me, but what I saw happen around the room that day. I learned how people thought and felt that I didn't know uh, before. And so I thought, I want to do that with my family. Yeah. Um, why wait till someone's gone before you start doing that mm-hmm. stuff? And so I decided we'd have uh, an annual tradition on our family vacations where we would do that. We'd pick one person and every other family member would tell what they love most or something they've observed uh, that they appreciate about that person. And over the years of doing that uh, in different parts of tropical cultures and stuff, uh, a lot of things have happened. I remember one time where we, uh, it, we didn't get it done at the restaurant so we, had, we finished in the hotel room. Um, I remember a time where a lady in a restaurant kept leaning over and leaning <laughs> over and leaning over. And about oh, a third of the way through, I see she's got tears in her eyes. So she was like right in there with us. I remember the time that Zach, your husband, was not your husband yet. And we gave him a pass out. Mm-hmm. And he says, no, 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 I'll do it. And the depth mm-hmm. that we learned was inside that dude. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. I think that's when we knew you guys were a perfect match. I remember telling Lily, um, man, I fell more in love with him that day. And she <laughs> said, and she said, me too. <laughs> the feelings were mutual all the way around. Yeah. But I, I think that's a, that's a really cool thing that anybody could do. Mm-hmm. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. Absolutely. But it is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It is vulnerable. But at the end of the day, I think what we'll see is that whether it's something we view as negative or positive, like positive affection, that vulnerability can be powerful. Yeah. So what about you? Do you believe that being vulnerable with others is tough? Because I'm right there with you. And I encourage you to ask yourself, which of these R words, reality, reputation, rejection, which of these R words is holding you back from being vulnerable with others, whether that's something negative or positive. And I wanna encourage you that if you take that step to become more vulnerable with others, that your relationships will grow, that they will deepen, and that you will experience Christ in a whole new way. As you know, my dad wrote a book called Street Smarts from Proverbs. And if you're a college student or a young adult, he wrote it with you in mind. Whether you're going through a crossroads and making a decision about your career or any other life choice, this book can be helpful in making those choices with wisdom. 